Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. This is the first of three talks I'm giving this week. The three will form a set. So if you feel a little bit unfulfilled at the end of that, it's because I'm only a third of the way through the talk. They are, however, designed to be uh, standalone talks as well. So hopefully you, you will not be as unfulfilled after the talk as you might be afraid of being. I'm also a bit jet lagged, so you'll have to forgive some of the, uh, the weird bizarre utterances. I want to talk about the concept of free, the concept of open learning, the concept of network, the network world, and the concept of institutions. Uh, we may, in a certain sense, think of this talk and the other talks as a rebuttal to the way institutions are approaching massive open online courses and open learning generally today. It's unfortunate that Diana Lorillard was not able to be here today because my first slide is for her. And she challenges the concept of the massive open online course by asking, what is the problem that MOOCs appear to have solved? And she answers it. The problem MOOCs succeed in solving is to provide free university teaching for highly qualified professionals. <laughs> well, one might answer that's what the traditional institution is doing as well. One might equally answer that that's what the internet was doing 20 years ago. What I want to examine in this talk is not the problem MOOCs actually solve at the moment, but the problem MOOCs were designed to solve. And I'll take a little bit of credit. I am one of the people that had a significant hand in designing the original concept of the massive open online course. And you know, Di Diana Lorillard actually answers the question in the same talk, the same paper she proposes the dilemma. She writes, by 2015, there'll be 53 million children out of school. And UNESCO estimates that we need 1.6 million teachers to achieve universal primary education. That's just primary education. That's not secondary. That's not tertiary. Just primary. And I did a, a quick off-the-cuff calculation at $50,000 $50, per student, 25,000 pounds we would need an additional $80 billion in salaries per year, not counting buildings, equipment, resources, etc. Maybe roughly 40 billion pounds. That's a lot of money. It's not inconceivable that we could pay this amount, but the difficulty is there seems to be no inclination on the part of governments and institutions in the world to actually pay this amount. We have to find, says Laurel Art, innovative ways of teaching. I would say we have to find more innovative ways of learning. Because the problem isn't the way we design our courses. That might be a solution to the problem, one solution. But the problem is cost and access. Design is only one way, and I would submit a limited way of looking at the problem. What is the problem? Very simple. Who gets to graduate? <coughs> Paul Tough, New York Times. Whether a student graduates or not seems to depend today almost entirely on one factor, how much money his or her parents make. You may look around this institution and ask whether that's the case here as well. Did it determine who got in? Does it determine who gets out? It's always going to be the case, he continues, that the kids who have need are going to have been denied a lot of the academic preparation and opportunities for identity formation that the affluent kids have been given. It's not simply the money, but it's the background, the expectations, the culture, and the values that the money provides. So simply throwing money at poor kids isn't going to solve the problem, but neither is denying the money to make solutions to these problems possible. 
money is a necessary, though admittedly not sufficient, condition. Let's turn the question around. What is the problem for which colleges and universities are the answer? Well, it's not addressing issues of cost or addressing issues of access, is it? If we look at the results that they have produced, it's exactly the opposite of that. Let's look at why colleges and universities and other educational institutions are actually running MOOCs. What are their issues? Well, they've been studied. One such study lists the following five reasons why institutions are building MOOCs. Check these off if they sound familiar. Check these off if you just heard them. Extend reach and access. Build and maintain brand. Reduce cost, that is the cost to the institution, and raise revenue for the institution. Improve educational outcomes. I can talk a lot about that. And of course, research and innovation in teaching and learning. See cost in there to students? See access to learning there for students? Meanwhile, academics deny that cost is even a problem. A ridiculous set of studies recently, the references are all there, argue that the benefits of college still outweigh the costs. The reason for that, if you read the article, is that the opportunity cost of going to college has gone down. What that means is when you go to college or university, you're giving up less income. Why? Well, because there's been a worldwide recession and you wouldn't make as much money. That's the argument. Financial aid programs drive college prices higher as though they were incapable of doing anything else. It's like when the uh, tuition uh, caps were raised here in the UK to 9,000 pounds and the expectation, naive though it was, was that universities would sort of settle out on a gradient instead of all raising their fees to 9,000 pounds. But we know what really drives the institution. And there's the argument that student debt is overstated, which is true if you, when you read the study, look at only people who are heads of households between the ages of 25 and 40. And don't look at the people who have not been able to establish their own household. In that case, student debt is overstated. But if you actually look at all students, you get a different story. We've been told outright that money is not the problem. The implication being that we should not spend any money trying to fix this problem. That's why we're getting a lot of, a lot of educational reform talk, or as it's characterized in North America, educational deform. And they're saying that what we really need is a culture change in the institution. What we really need is accountability perhaps to the BMO financial group that offered this study. <laughs> but for many people, let's be realistic here, and you can walk down the street and you can see it. For many people, cost is the problem. In Canada, in North America, in general, university participation rates are lower among aboriginals, students with disabilities, the poor, Big surprise. <coughs> debt, student debt acquired not only by paying tuition, but by paying that opportunity cost that isn't as much now, has become an even bigger problem. And it's interesting, you, you look at in constant dollars, <coughs> higher ed costs and instructional costs, eh, they're more or less steady. The students are getting nailed on student loan interest, that's the uh, light blue line, mm -hmm. and the private colleges are making up like bandits. Not only are students hurt, so are their families. This is a study from the Canadian Association of Student Associations. Parents are borrowing more. They're going back to work. They're dipping into their retirement savings. 
those very same studies that say debt is not a problem are studies that ignore the impact on families that are supporting students trying to go to school. And meanwhile, the benefits, remember that? Those of you who are maybe my age, the benefits of digital resources, this open knowledge for all, never materialized. Recently, we have a report in the Chronicle of Higher Education. All of the publishers are raising their prices all at the same time. But there's no collusion. The previous cost model for ebooks was not sustainable. Even universities agree that that's a problem. Pretty surprisingly. Journals published by nonprofit organizations says this report, two to 10 times better value than those published by commercial companies. Of course, the journals don't want you to know this. Academia doesn't want you to know this. And they will publish these reports only after threats of mass resignations. That's what happened just a couple uh, of months ago. And then when they publish the report, they'll publish it with a big disclaimer saying it might not be true. That's, those are the guardians of academic knowledge. And what we're seeing in the community today are calls to recognize alternative forms of literature. I'm a living alternative form of literature. <laughs> They're calling on people to recognize research and technical reports, of which I produce a lot, evaluations, of which I produce a lot, working papers, which is pretty much all I produce in the way of papers, conference papers like this, which isn't even a paper until well after it's actually created, multimedia content, and the like. Maybe there's a reason for this. This stuff is a lot more accessible, a lot more immediate than traditional published literature. <laughs> now, the, the internet 20 years ago was providing services only to highly educated professionals. And 20 years ago, 1994, a guy called Stephen Hernet came out with what he called the subversive proposal. <laughs> the super, subversive proposal was to free the research literature through self archiving This has kind of morphed a little bit over the years, but it's basically still the same concept today. Originally, the idea was to put these things up on FTP servers. FTP servers are kind of like websites, but without pictures, or links, or hypertext, or chat. Well, I don't know, they, they did have chat videos. <laughs> Self-archiving's time, writes in a later presentation, has yet to come, 20 years later. That doesn't mean there hasn't been a movement. There has been a movement. There's been the growth of a movement. The idea based on the firm belief that open access holds, at the very least, the promise of a faster and more effective system of sharing new knowledge. And it's a promise that resonates not simply in the halls of university like, universities like this, but in places where people are impacted by cost and access in the developing world, in the First Nations communities, among the poor. You now, it's no coincidence that the World Wide Web was created 20 years ago as well. The first accredited school, according to Phil Hill, to offer a course over the WWW, which is what it was called then, was the Open University in a pilot virtual summer school. My own first online learning resource was called Stephen's Guide to the Logical Fallacies. And I'm a relative newbie because it was published online as a website early in 1995. I'm a neophyte. And our first institutionally based online course, Introduction to Instruction at Assiniboine Community College was offered in 1996. But you know, we're still waiting for the benefits of web-based courses as well. This, this whole openness thing, this whole access thing, right? 
I once did a, a survey, and it was actually specifically for digital rights management technologies for learning resources. I did a survey of how long it would take me to read all of the patents, because I was developing my own system. I thought it would be a good idea. It would take, I calculate, it would take me more than a lifetime to read them all. The history of online learning is the history of a plethora of patents. This is a patent for setting up a regional network in southwestern United States. That's uh, Nevada, that's Arizona, that's New Mexico, that's Utah, that's Colorado, or Wyoming. One square ones. <laughs> Calling it a patent. Fitchit is more of a slight understatement. And it's not just patents, of course. It's copyright, trademarks, even trade secrets. Here's one that came out just a few weeks ago. Trademark for, and I've actually got a screen capture for pie. Yes, pie. The pie that you're all familiar with. 3.141 pi or whatever. Colleague memorized it to 100 digits. I've memorized it to what? One. <laughs> <laughs> and this is not simply an isolated instance. It's the norm. It's a phenomenon that took place in the Industrial Revolution, it's a phenomenon taking place in the Information Revolution, it's a phenomenon of enclosure. And you would think we learned from the last time, but we didn't. And it threatens the commons, the common heritage, common knowledge, common culture that we all thought that we own. People say, oh, I'm scaremongering, that these fears won't really come true. Hey, over again. Just show us one example. Well, here's one example. A study of 50 titles. This was from New Zealand literature prior to, I think it's 1890 or something like that, that had been digitized. Only three were hosted by repositories that do not restrict any, kind, any type of subsequent use. These are contents that are public domain. The copyright has long since expired. But you cannot access them except through a system that imposes limitations to your reuse. And it's getting worse. Content companies now are building web browsers. This is a uh, promo for the new Amazon web browser. One cookie, you can be watching the best in pay TV. I love the way it's represented. Watch for zero dollars with Prime, right? You're supposed to think it's free. <coughs> but the only reason there's a price there is because episode one with one cookie cost you $2.99, or you can buy the season for $29.99, or maybe you can buy an open access public domain work for, well, who knows how much, right? Content providers, and this is manifest, clear, and well known, do not want people to have free and open access. <coughs> Newspapers, good example. People got used to having their news for free on the internet, but they've been trying desperately to stop that. And, you know, there, there's almost a sense in which they have no sense of community as they do this. And you might think that that's an extreme case. Well, it wasn't so long ago, a month or so ago, I forget the exact date, half uh, we, we had some guy heavily armed in Moncton with assault rifles, he had them strapped on his back. And he went out and started shooting policemen. And so the whole city was locked down. And I was locked down. We were all locked down. City became a ghost town. Huge story. You may have heard about it even here. No? 
We probably made the international news just on it. It was a big story in Moncton. <laughs> Our local newspaper did not remove the paywall barrier. Even though the safety of people on the street depended on free and open access to news. My little alternative community-based web newspaper, the Moncton Free Press, was the major source of online news during the event. That plus Facebook, plus Reddit, plus the other social networks. Their priorities are not our priorities. And, sad to say, this includes especially universities. Look at what their priorities are. Universities searching for a new president, 400 Chase Howard. Staff there, some of the staff there are volunteering in groups of four to take that salary. <laughs> no word on whether their offer has been accepted, but 56 of them that have already volunteered in groups of four. The resistance, generally, of academic staff to open content is manifest. Here's a report from here where we see active change blocking and passive forms of intransigence. The sharing of resources only happens on Moodle. Did I see that in the slide recently? Which is a closed system. Maybe open source, but the content is blocked with a subscription wall. Staff have not had time to effectively learn about and embed open content in their work. This is a report that was cited by Terry Anderson, and you can see the report presented at an open courseware conference in February of this year. Even at that conference, skepticism prevails. This is Tony Bates reporting that adoption by faculty and instructors remains a major challenge. And this was repeated over and over and over. Peter Suber and the aforementioned Stephen Harnett have come to argue that institutions need to adopt mandatory open archiving policies. Now why did they advocate such a measure? Because faculty left to their own devices won't bother. And that's well documented. There's no end to the reasons they offer. For many disciplines, they say, there is no open textbook available. Well, that's not true, but that's what they say. So they're concerned about the quality, the comprehensiveness, clarity, currency, etc., as if existing textbooks are such models of comprehensiveness, clarity, and currency. <laughs> They complain that in the world's most visual medium, there's no illustrations, charts, or graphics. In the world of chat rooms and YouTube comments, there's no questions or critical thinking exercises. No online learning management systems available, despite the existence of the aforementioned Moodle. And crucially for faculty, there is no test bank. Professors who call out the institutional policies, the institutional indifference to cost and access, are accused of insubordination. This is a professor at the University of Saskatchewan, Robert Buckingham, who was fired, summarily fired and stripped of tenure for criticizing administration plans to quote unquote rationalize. Universities, meanwhile, disguise what is an increasingly unsustainable model by doing what they were doing to me, hiring poorly paid temporary academic staff. They're called sessionals in Canada, they're called adjuncts in the United States, I don't know what they're called here. I don't know if they exist here. They do, I'm getting nods. This is what the, the adjuncts or sessionals say, our, mar our marginalization, meager pay, and lack of job security, all of which I can attest, all contribute to a culture of paranoia 
and enmity. Sound familiar? And our institutions who do not have access and openness as a priority of Christ online learning using the same models, same mechanisms even, that they've used to Christ in class learning. Here we have a report on an online learning consortium and the report says, I, well, I say, I don't see why university administrators could think that unapologetically, and that's a quote, pricing courses at $1,400 per credit hour. Per credit hour, most courses are about three credit hours, six credit hours, for online learning to possibly work. But of course, it worked in traditional institutions, so it should work online. And mostly they see the new technology as a means to make more money. McGill University, looking at the new wonderful phenomenon of, of crowdsourcing, has decided to use crowdsourcing to encourage donations. <laughs> and yet, again, the silo model, the, the model where the university is all prevails, they didn't use Kickstarter, they built their own crowdfunding platform. Boggles the mind. While well, university fundraisers pursue parochial interests, open content advocates create resource networks. And that's a big difference between the world of closed and the world of open. Why? Well, open access makes a massive economic difference. Maybe not to the institution, although I would argue that it does, but especially to the users of that institution. The estimated rate from open data for the G20 nations is $2.6 trillion, 1.3 trillion pounds annually from education, transport, consumer products, and the rest. And the mechanisms we have today, such as the Creative Commons license, Creative Commons license, are being recognized finally as a patch, not a fix. We shouldn't be adopting this world of closed content and copyrights and trademarks and patents as the default. They are now arguing finally that we should be working to a world where the default is open. And you know, that is the world outside academia. That's the world that has been unfolding in my experience, in my world. Not good enough. <laughs> Things like Ergo, a free and open journal of philosophy. Things like mini lectures using learning objects by Susan Smith, Susan Smith Nash, which should not have a hyphen in there, sorry, Susan. Things like a new talk sketched daily. By, Del, or by Torch Novik May, or by Del Harvey. Even Ted, <coughs> Ted is, as I once commented, really, the upworthy of academia. <laughs> Things like the Open Textbook Toolkit from BC Campus. Basically a way to help people who want to create an open textbook, create an open textbook. We are seeing what Martin Weller has called the open virus. And he writes, it's no coincidence that many of the MOOC pioneers had also been early adopters of open access, active bloggers, and advocates of open licenses. And creating open courses in that model seemed the next logical step. You know, can we imagine a world of open resource, open access, open learning beyond the traditional world of open courseware, beyond the traditional university model. Maybe even the Open Courseware Consortium is changing its name, so we must be getting somewhere. And we're seeing a worldwide, literally, embrace of an alternative model of learning based on open content. And even national and pan-national investments in open content networks and open content platforms. 
But of course, there's nothing that can't be corrupted by money. Should know looking across the river. So we have, for example, a company that produces five minute educational videos, and they're not TED videos, TED videos are longer, with the intent of making them go viral. Or we have this free online lesson from Disney called Play Games with Doc McStuffins. <laughs> no media placement there. <laughs> and universities, traditional universities, are not immune, sadly, from this temptation. And events have proven that they're not. And some critics take them to task. And they take them to task for MOOCs. People like Roger Shank saying, I'm sure that Stanford itself won't give the stuff they produce to its own students. Yes, he put an apostrophe in there, I'm sorry. <laughs> no one calls this racism or classism, but it's education for poor people. On the other hand, Shank's solution to the Stanford education to everyone is ridiculous. I did the math. $32.5 trillion a year. That's more money than there is in the world. <laughs> And perhaps for that reason, it's hard to resist the idea that MOOCs are money-making scams. You take the people charging that kind of tuition and you put MOOCs into their hands, that's kind of the image you get, isn't it? And you almost wonder, where the, wonder whether this you know, $0.00 dollar MOOC offering is what they call a lost leader, right? They'll get you hooked on the MOOCs, this free open content, and as soon as you're hooked on the MOOCs, well, now it's going to cost you a dollar, five dollars, nineteen ninety nine, thirty nine ninety nine. Still cheaper than, of course, but you know. Online education is a billion dollar business motivated more by profits than quality education for students. And the research is telling us how bad these MOOCs really are. If you were isolated, poor, and enamored of the prestigious MOOC university offering, the MOOC you're taking, you are less likely to complete it, etc., etc. But of course, the sort of MOOC that these critics are criticizing are the MOOCs created by the same people, in some cases, exactly the same people like Richard Levin, for example, who wanted to raise money selling courses online, and who also give the impression in interviews that they don't really know what the software they're pushing does. We need to understand that MOOCs, as they were designed, are different. That they're not traditional courses. They're not these money-making scams. They're not intended to be anyway. And we can begin by dropping the labels and the value points that we attach to traditional learning. For example, the label dropout. And characterize people taking moves by the impact that they actually have on the system. Uploaders, commenters, subscribers, viewers, lurkers, all the names you would normally associate with day-to-day -day internet practice, because that's what the moves are based on. It's true that one thing that characterizes the MOOCs is the sheer scale of participation. 1162 students taking the final exam at this course, writes one person, is more of students than I've taught at Wellesley College over the last 10 years, quite so. But these numbers are not telling the story about MOOCs. Michael Feldstein asks, uh, MOOC analytics, did they look at any information giving us a clue on whether students desired to complete the course? Answer, no. Or get a good grade? Answer, no. Get a certificate? Well, some. Or just sample some material? No, that's not one of the questions they ask in these surveys. And what we're finding, this is research from the MOOC Research Institute, that's George Siemens' thing at the University of Texas in Arlington. The bulk of MOOCs are created in the image of traditional courses. And eventually, I would say, they will be given the prices of traditional courses. And indeed, the retrenchment has begun. The institution is saying, 
MOOCs will not replace the traditional course. They will only supplement them. The phenomenon they call the wrapped MOOC. That chart, everything is negotiable. Remember that? That is the retrenchment. From my perspective, none of it is negotiable, especially the most important part, open. But traditional education, we are told, will simply absorb the MOOC, as it has absorbed, or as we say, co-opted so many things in the past. Rap, punk, the list goes on. And that institutions feel that they would simply absorb the MOOC doesn't surprise me. These institutions have had very different goals and ambitions all along. The mission has shifted completely away from MOOC, completely away from open learning, and into support of the university's prosperity. Does that sound familiar? They want to build a new marketplace. I may even think it's a new idea. This is the next land rush of online learning, the MOOC marketplace. If you hear the word federation in a talk, this is what they're referring to. A coalition of interdependent universities providing an LMS content repository and learning analytics system, which might connect, maybe, if they support a single sign-on, some external systems. But what's important here, and yes, I'm close to that, is that MOOCs are not second rate. They're not disappearing. They're not being absorbed or anything else. They are, to borrow that horribly hackneyed phrase, disruptive. And they're going to be disruptive on price, technology, even pedagogy. But that's because they're disruptive in terms of approach. approach is that MOOCs are designed and built and intended to be free and open. The one thing universities have always struggled with. The idea of a national network for free learning is something that can endure and eventually become entrenched, and is becoming entrenched, but mostly outside the university system. We're beginning to see the importance of this. Matt Crossman has been trying to design a hybrid MOOC where you take all the connected bits of a, of a connectivist MOOC the way we designed it and mix it up with the traditional X MOOC of traditional academic courses. And the idea of free and open here, as he recognizes, is linked to the importance of dialogue and interaction. But why would you build a hybrid? What part of dialogue and interaction actually requires a university system and lectures in the works? If you look at and analyze the nature of conversation, it turns out we can do it all by ourselves. So people like Alan Levine and many others say, let's build mesh networks of people instead. Let's imagine what we could do on a limited budget with free resources that are already out there that we can share, that we can use to communicate, that we can have other people take and run with to solve their own issues, their own problems, their own needs. Open content plus conversations equals learning networks, and the original MOOCs were intended not to be high-priced or even free university courses. They were intended to be learning networks. The idea that professors tell students what to believe, that's the old model. And it's wrong. And we're learning more as time goes by with the work of these MOOCs about what actually does work in these learning networks. Things like the principles for dynamic networks. Some draw from Deleuze and Guattari. I've identified four <coughs> principles, autonomy, openness, diversity, and interactivity. We've seen the existence and the influence of networks in social life, as seen, for example, by Harrison C. White. The multiple chains overlapping next, no clear boundaries, exactly, again, the opposite of the university, especially one with a big fence around it with spiky poles. The structure of the MOOC is the structure of the network. The principles of the MOOC are the principles of the network. 
There's no such thing as a generic resource. There's no such thing as a generic person. There's no such thing as a generic neuron. Networks require and thrive on diversity. Different content created by different individuals, not single content created by what? An institution or a professor. Far from curriculum, we're learning that we should be emphasizing diversity, be emphasizing experience, and be emphasizing autonomy in learning. The idea of the MOOC is not just the idea of open resources, or even the idea of open teaching. It goes beyond that. It's about living openly. It's not about teaching. It's about sharing the process of thought. And if you look at my work, ignore these talks. Look at the work as a whole and see the example of the MOOC instantiated, literally, on a day-to-day -day basis. Sharing with things like board thing. Sharing with things like Mookopoly, the game. Sharing with things that are decentralized, not centralized. Of course, decentralized is exactly what the institutions are talking down on. Decentralized is why internet access is being sold to the highest bidder. Decentralized is why the open content movement is beginning to address open policy. Although, of course, they released it under a content embargo. We need to be open, not just in the big things, but also in the little things. The little things like this talk, the little things like this slide, the little things like this picture of boats shooting at each other. Open content, <coughs> open access, open learning. These are not only a part of democracy, a part of the free exchange of ideas, a part of the culture of learning, but they define all of these. And they define our system of free and open government. And these systems depend on it. And so when I say the institution has different values from us, it's important to understand exactly what it is that the institution has different values from. Thank you. Thank you.